Dina was not a feminist artist and really did not look at other women as role models. She was a pure artist who the determining factor was the quality of the art. Is it a great piece of art, regardless of gender? As an artist, Dina was a real abstract expressionist. She started as a painter. It was later in her career that she became a metal sculptor. The material spoke to her, and she said more than once that the reason she stopped painting is that a blank canvas did not speak to her the way a bin of scrap metal did. Dina Wynn was an artist who was quite active in the Philadelphia art scene. She started off as a painter, but by the mid-1980s, she was involved in creating steel sculpture. She took a a local welding class, but this became pretty viral for her. She became really interested in visiting scrap yards and collecting all types of metal scrap and welding it into small scale and large scale sculpture. And in this process, she made quite a name for herself in the Philadelphia, New York area. Her husband, Jerry Wind, and she simultaneously were very involved in the Philadelphia art world. They loved to travel and collect artwork and were in service to different organizations in the Philadelphia area that created important linkages of their love of art to their community. It was determined that Harp of David was the one that seemed to be the best fit for the site, but also for the type of sculpture that it was and how it fit the experience of Grounds for Sculpture, how it was going to play a key role at this particular point in the park, not only being an enlargement of one of Dina's strongest works, but how it was going to create a presence in the park and work well with the experience that one has here. A lot of people are uncomfortable with abstract art because it's, sometimes they can't figure out if there's a meaning to it or something like that. With this, you've got known objects that people have taken and rearranged in a different way than they would normally be arranged. It took about six months to build. The sculpture has 11 elements. We broke down the different parts to figure out how to make each piece. And by making it from a one inch scale to 26 feet, a lot of the elements were standard material, which was helpful. If we would have had to fabricate odd sizes, that would have been more complicated. Each section was digitally scanned and also using CAD programs. Our supervisor, Adam, was able to break down each piece to what we needed, how it would be bent, how it would be formed, and then we worked from there to start putting section by section together. Once the pieces were made, we basically kind of started from the bottom and worked our way up. The base was made, and then as each element was fabricated, it was added and welded in place. Using the original sculpture as a template and taking measurements and scaling up to the proper size to make everything fit together seamlessly. Taking a three inch sprocket to a three foot sprocket was a challenge. We, again, simplified that form as well. It turned into a series of plates surrounding a piece of tubing, and that took a lot of welding and parts being put together. The layout of the teeth on the larger gear elements, each tooth was cut and machined. We basically made it a little spacing jig, laid out probably five or six at a time, clamped on, welded on, and then moved our way around until it was finished. Digital Tellier, it scanned the whole piece. Having that digital data makes it extremely easier to get the size we want to increase it to. The digital enlarging process has really changed art in a lot of ways. When you look at it, there's these diamond shapes. So we had to have it laser cut. Every one of those was, was laser cut. I found the process working at Waste Gas really exciting because they are industry standard building large items. 
and we come in as artists saying, can you bend this for us? Can you cut this for us? And they were excited because it was something different. So when we brought in our two and a half inch steel plate to be cut by a plasma flame cutter, and we were able to see some of the process, that was incredible. Because they've taken a giant piece of plate and with a computer aided flame cutter, they were able to cut all those diamonds out and it was fascinating to watch. It was very exciting. Watching them do the perforated metal, which are the circles, and how that worked. You say, how do they get those perfect circles? And the machines come in and push a hole through it with a flame, go in a circle, it drops out. And they did so many of them when you look at the piece. And yet when you look at the original, it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Watching it form, there were times when I saw the spirals and the gears going up and saying, how is this all going to stay together? And watching Adam work and putting it part by part together, yeah, it became reality. Everything that we do here that's of any size or could cause a, a, some kind of a dangerous situation, we have engineered. So they're way over-engineered. It's, it's engineered for 150 mile per hour winds. This piece is really pretty open. It's, it's, it's not so bad, but it's, it's the welds. There's a lot of heavy elements on there. You can't lift that, it all has to be lifted by cranes. We have a special, uh, what we call the high bay in the atelier, that was built to fabricate large pieces. So we have cranes that can lift 20,000 pounds and more, and cranes that can work in tandem so that we can flip things like that crane operators that we work with that have been doing this kind of work for years and they were essential in getting the piece into Grounds for Sculpture because we couldn't take the whole piece as a completed work. It wouldn't fit through the roadways and past the trees. We could only take it in at half built. So we had to slowly bring it in, get around trees, go up and down hills and finally get it to its spot where we could use a crane to get it on the spot and then bring in the last four elements to weld them on. So that was a challenge, to be able to get everything to work and fit and do the final welding. It's made out of uh, basic steel, so there are no treatments. It's not going to be painted. It's not going to have a patina like a bronze patina would have. It's not stainless steel that would have a reflective quality. It's a material that's going to weather and completely turn color. Harp of David is uh, very unique in the collection of Grounds for Sculpture for a couple of major reasons. First of all, there are few sculptures in the collection that are actually using completely recycled forms. It has a very, very wide breach of drawing in space in terms of the circular forms. They're arcing around the space, creating this kind of dynamism that the sculptures in our collection don't always employ. Atelier has done such a spectacular job in replicating those forms that they still have the, the form of the original. The team was basically led by Adam, and then we had Hank and Eli and Jamie as a backup on that. I can't say enough about them. They, all, they were interested in the project and it really showed. They would hit it running in the morning. You can always tell when somebody enjoys working on something. She was fabulous in just pushing forward and being one of a kind as a woman um, welder and fabricator, uh, again, in the artistic mode. She uh, was inspired to do it and just said, this is something I can do. The River Birch LA site, it's one of the most important sites in the center of the sculpture park. It's a site that I had been hoping to do something different with for the benefit of everyone, the benefit of changing an experience at Grounds for Sculpture and also making an important work by Dina Wynn larger. And so it's actually an honor to be able to do that for someone like Dina Wynn who made such important work. The highlight of the entire project 
was having the Wynn family, John and Jerry, come to the Seward Johnson Atelier to see the partially built sculpture for the first time. I watched them go around the corner and the look of delight on their faces was incredible. They laughed, they almost jumped up and down. They were so excited to see the reality of it. Looking at uh, the elements of the sculpture on the ground or in process in this huge size was an unbelievable experience. I think it was the realization of Dina's dream that she had always, while she never made a, a, a piece this large uh, during her lifetime, it was always a conversation. It was always something she aspired to. To see this happen and to see you know, dozens of people interacting with it, taking pictures with it, and to know that this piece is going to be around and to have those interactions in the future, that was really the most mm -hmm. moving part for me. You know, touch, get involved with this. It's mm -hmm. not uh, something that you should not touch. You should get involved. To take pictures, take selfies with this. Uh, primarily enjoy the kind of the interaction with the art. Follow your dreams. Dina had a dream in terms of creating beautiful sculptures. She had a really advanced sense of aesthetics and beauty. And uh, all her sculptures, even though they're rough, tough materials and they're strong, uh, they reflect beauty. They're beautiful pieces of art. It's beautiful to look at. 